Uh, but within 10 years, then this project of a socialist intellectual hegemony materialized. Uh, Reza Shah's regime was overthrown when the Allies invaded and occupied Iran, and under joint Allied occupation, including the Soviets in the north, uh, there emerged a political party, the Tudeh Party of Iran, which began as a, a coalition, kind of social democratic, nationalist, constitutionalist, but very quickly, it turned into um, its leadership, its ideas. It was a typical kind of um, Stalinist Communist Party of the 1940s, 50s. Uh, but the Tudeh Party was um, uh, extremely popular and influential. It basically took up the same agenda that was introduced earlier, a generation ago. Uh, uh, and it has, by and large, everyone who hates them grudgingly admit that 20th century Iran has had only one political party in the sense of a popular agenda and the sense of linking up to social classes. Because this was the party that classically, as communist parties usually, if they're successful, do, linked up the middle class intelligentsia to some kind of a working class base. It, it had links to the trade unions, and it was popular by some estimates, by you know, people in New York Times had predicted that in a free elections, the two they would have pulled 40% of the vote. So this was a phenomenally successful, extremely scary phenomenon. Um, and so I take the two their party with all of its problems and failings as, a, as an enormously significant event in uh, Iranian political and intellectual history, something that makes my treatment of this topic different from uh, a few existing ones. Um, now, uh, the today, although it was more or less openly Marxist, uh, in fact, Stalinist, of course, uh, it did not propose a strictly socialist agenda. Uh, at best, the agenda was social democratic. Uh, nor was its practice geared towards some kind of a revolutionary seizure of power. And when the hour came, when there was a military coup, 1953, the CIA organized coup, the two there basically did nothing. Um, I would say because it was never prepared for that kind of eventuality. In fact, it was a very extremely successful parliamentary party. In the semi-democratic parliamentary system that Iran had in the 1940s, the irony was the Stalinist party was the most popular, successful uh, party in a parliamentary system because there was nobody else who could compete. I mean, I'm not saying there were no other political tendencies, but the kind of uh, practice that the today had initiated was uh, unrivaled. Uh, but it was not, it, it also had a underground military network. But uh, at, at the hour of, uh, you know, uh, fate, uh, it just was immobilized and, of course, destroyed. But I take uh, the intellectual legacy of uh, to their party as something uh, very important. And uh, it, not just the party itself, but uh, those who opposed it, those who split from it. There were socialist splinters from it. There was social democratic, uh, kind of European type variety of social democratic uh, socialism, anti-communist, but that also had presence and influence. Uh, there was an organization called uh, the Organization of God-Worshipping Socialists. Um, and interestingly, they didn't call themselves Islamic socialists, they call themselves God-worshipping because they wanted to expand beyond Muslims. Um, and uh, the idea was uh, socialism is perfectly compatible with philosophically, um, you believe in God, uh, but in terms of like social uh, project, you are a socialist. These ideas are enormously important. For example, Ali Shariati, the theorist of the Islamic Revolution grew up from a background of this uh, God-worshipping socialist. I would say that his basic ideas were formed in his youth um, because of this background rather than 
whatever he learned in Paris in, in the years that he spent abroad. So um, these kinds of reactions, uh, a lot of uh, um, kind of uh, socially conscious clergy began to uh, write responses to socialism and Marxism, uh, reading the Quran more compatible with leftist ideas. Uh, that kind of thing also was a response to uh, the Tudeh party. Now, here's where I bring myself into this story. Both of my parents were members of the Tudeh party. Uh, and, uh, uh, but they were, uh, they were very young. They were university students. Uh, they, were, they worked, they were employees of the National Bank of Iran, where they had met. And uh, there's a spin to the story that 50 years later, when I was teaching here at UCLA, uh, I had a student who I visited at their house. He introduced me to his father. And when he heard my name, said, Mateen, I knew both of your parents. And I said, what the heck? This is 50 years later. You just met. How do you know my parents? He said, I was the head of their uh, clandestine to the party branch in the bank. They never knew me, but I, I knew them. And now 50 years later, I can tell you that I knew, <laughs> that I knew your parents. Um, they, uh, they became disillusioned leftists, and uh, sort of that was my, uh, you know, how I came into the picture with this idea that, you know, socialism, egalitarian societies, idealism, everything, these are, these are beautiful, great ideas, but uh, something went wrong with their implementation. And uh, so uh, this sense of uh, revolution betrayed uh, here I want to um, just go up to my next, uh, all right. And that's uh, Leon Trotsky. Uh, Kevin told me use uh, some book covers or uh, some kind of interesting images. This is an actual book that I read when I was in high school, uh, say early 1970s, and this is my life. Trotsky is my life. Revolution Betrayed was not allowed to be translated, but this was openly and legally kind of available, so I had read it. So I had this idea that, uh, you know, uh, you could make the world's most shattering event and uh, it could go bad, uh, so to speak, and that's not a surprise. So um, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's Leon. Um, then I came to the U.S. after finishing high school in Iran and uh, immediately joined. There was this massive Iranian student movement whose history later I wrote as my uh, dissertation and then first book. And I joined, and this movement, I don't want to go into talking about that book and that period, but uh, it was uh, leftist, of course. It had different factions. Originally, it was not just leftists. Nationalists, Muslims are part of it, too. So they were basically driven out. And yet, it had different factions. The idea was it was not a uh, singular political party. There are different factions that fought each other, like the Islamic Republic. And uh, it also, mostly they were Maoists, the followers of also a lot of sympathy for the Iranian guerrillas. But the movement also had a margin for people who considered themselves intellectual leftists, the type that I liked, the types that kind of we started having you know, group studies and study Lenin a little bit more than let's go to Marx and then let's question Engels and Lenin and let's see if we really understand Marx, what he said. And so there was that kind of a margins of this movement too. And then the revolution came, 1978, I was not at UCLA yet, I was a student at Cal State LA, and uh, at some point I decided, okay, I'm ready, I'm gonna go, everybody's going to go and join, and so uh, I left, and uh, I don't have very many exciting images. This is uh, Fred Halliday's book uh, uh, that I had uh, in my pocket reading on the plane, going to Iran as uh, one of my you know, handbooks, and uh, let's see. Where is me? At, uh, and here's me. <laughs> here I managed to bring myself in. Uh, this is true. It's the Prime Minister's LAX, December 1978. And 
I had uh, not only the scarf, but I also had one of those fisherman's hats that I lost in a, uh, in a protest. So um, let's stay on, on Fred's book. That's better. Uh, just, just to remember him. I want to remember a lot of people. Um, so um, let me see. Um, I, remembering people, I, I skipped over something that uh, when I was um, before the revolution, uh, even before the revolution, I used to go and audit Bob's uh, classes. It was just the theory of transition was all over my life. Before I took your seminar, uh, I would just go and audit uh, kind of my uh, own self-education on the side. I had become a history major. I went to our school library and read uh, the entire, at that point, 20 years of New Left Review, all of Perry's debates with this or that, bring them on, it would take them on, Lucio Coletti, whoever it was. And so uh, I thought I'm ready, I'm ready and here, here I come. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, but I re but remember that I, I went as someone almost I'm uh, almost expecting um, the disappointment, uh, and I was disappointed. As soon as I got there, even before the Islamic Republic was formed, I didn't believe in it. I was opposed to it. So it was a very difficult what do you call it between something and a hard place. I was uh, I was opposed to the regime that was falling, and I was opposed to the regime that was not yet formed. And uh, it's not a very good place. Um, and uh, uh, there were some people on the left, a very small minority, uh, who uh, saw this and wrote uh, that uh, I was one of them. I have some of my, I got a job at some leftist newspaper in Tehran. And I have my articles to, to prove. You have to read Persian. but. Uh, uh, I did say that the Islamic Republic, as it's showing, this is before it was formed, it has very strong kind of fascist tendencies. And what to do is the left has to kind of close ranks with liberals, with, you know, remember Germany in the 1930s. And we have, that's what we have to do. Um, the Iranian left at that time was really a huge uh, movement, hundreds of thousands of mostly university and high school students. And the, most of them were completely taken by the heroism and the heroics and the sacrifices of the guerrilla movement, both Islamic and uh, Marxist. And it was very inexperienced. It was theoretically unsophisticated. Uh, and. Uh, the kind of arguments that I was making didn't have much of a chance. That project, by the way, of getting the left, the nationalist, the moderate Islamists together in some kind of a united front to block the advance of this kind of new uh, onslaught was tried. There was an organization, and I wasn't a member of it. I never joined any organization. Uh, but. Um, uh, except one student organization. There's someone here who knows, so that's it. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, it, it, it did not work because the two main guerrilla organizations who had now come above ground and had massive following did not join. Not, I don't want to blame them, but it, it just didn't work. So I'm saying the idea was there, it was tried, uh, but uh, not only the left was inexperienced, young, young in a literal sense, um, but it, remember that it faced something that the world had never seen before. There was never a massively popular revolution mobilizing people from the lower classes and eventually led by the Shi'i clergy. So what this is, was an amazingly complicated uh, uh, you know, Khomeini in his kind of amazing rhetoric once said, well, what are these intellectuals uh, bickering about? They're, they're talking about democracy, this and that. Uh, uh, what, um, uh, they don't, they, people don't want that. People, people are voting for us. You, these are your issues, your, your concerns. Um, 
So uh, what do you do if you are that kind of a left? Well, they were confused. Most of them, uh, not the Islamic left, but the most of the Marxist left followed a revived to their party, whose leaders had come back from exile in Eastern Europe. And uh, their idea was to uh, get on the good side of Khomeini and uh, get him as close as possible to the Soviet Union and incite anti-Americanism, understood as anti-imperialism, and that was the imam's line, the, the anti-imperialist line of the revolution that they would uh, promote. Uh, not all of the left. Uh, those who didn't then had to figure out what to do with uh, a situation that quickly became even more complex. There was the hostage crisis, and there, the Islamic Republic then got on the bad side of the U.S., which was not necessarily hostile to the post-revolutionary regime. It was trying to reconcile somehow. The hostage crisis, uh, an event that, I mean, you can't blame it on the U.S. Uh, the, it was calculated to outmaneuver the left and um, uh, get the Islamic Republic's constitution, which wasn't getting much tracking. This was a second draft of the constitution that established a clerical regime. Uh, it, was, it had a lot of opposition from different parts of the country. Parts of the country were up in arms rebellion against it. Many clergy were opposed to it. But once the Islamic Republic is standing up to the U.S., uh, then it's impossible to oppose it. Uh, also because in the middle of that, then uh, there was an Iran-Iraq war began. Um, their neighboring country, and here the Islamic Republic was not entirely blameless. Khomeini had called for Saddam Hussein's overthrow. And if you're vulnerable and you call for Saddam's overthrow, Saddam might invade you. Uh, and also if you're taking American hostages at the same time. Uh, so that's what happened. But... Uh, it also helped regime consolidation. That, that was the longest lasting Middle East war in modern times and uh, enormously costly damaging. But the Islamic Republic consolidated itself. It imposed a reign of terror. Part of the left, the Islamic left, finally were cornered and they decide to bring down the regime by armed rebellion. The Mujahideen tried that. Uh, they did not have really you know, the, uh, although for, for a moment they decapitated the regime by killing almost its entire leadership in one uh, bombing. Uh, but basically they were slaughtered with uh, anybody else who, um, this is a time when, uh, you know, they would just pick you up and put you in a street corner and shoot you. Uh, so that was the physical decimation of the Iranian left in the early 1980s, uh, the post-revolutionary period. Uh, then what happened to the remnants of the left, by, by the way, the two-day party did not get uh, scot-free either. Uh, it more or less, uh, if not cooperating, but also encouraged the regime to get rid of uh, the pro-American left. Whoever was not pro-Soviet obviously was pro-American. Uh, but once the regime did that, it came back and uh, destroyed the Tudor party also. Put all of the leaders on TV to confess they were spies of the Soviet Union, and they did. And uh, that was that. That was the end of that. So uh, what happened to uh, the remnants of the left, uh, those who uh, you know, could manage to, to stay alive or to go into exile or uh, exile groups? Uh, continued as exile groups do. They grew old. They started kind of bickering and factional fighting and turning into 200 different uh, groups and organizations. And uh, uh, the Mujahideen, the Islamic left, also turned into some kind of a weird cult. And uh, it's, it still exists, but I think it's just of a convenient uh, scarecrow that uh, the U.S. uses to uh, you know, to as leverage on the Islamic Republic to tell them you have an armed opposition. Um, and I don't think the Islamic Republic even takes them seriously, but they also use them as a 
boogeyman to tell people, oh yeah, there's scarier people than us. And uh, you better hang in with, uh, with the enemy you know. Um, so um, this is about, uh, I can see that people are becoming restless. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up soon. Uh, this is about, uh, I, this is where I want to fast forward to, uh, towards the present. Many people like myself in exile, I think, I don't know, maybe some are here. We can correct me or give a different interpretation. We just took refuge in, in the academe. Um, I was a historian. I kind of managed to become legal in the country, got to UCLA, um, kind of at least I was intellectually engaged with what was going on. Um, but uh, just again, going back to my own perspective, because I was a kind of leftist who um, my ideas did not hinge on some kind of some kind of actually existing socialism. So if kind of being on the left could withstand the uh, Bolshevik revolution deteriorating, you could still be a leftist when you saw what happened in Islamic Republic. The Iranian revolution failing was not like such a great shock. And eventually kind of we lived on to see the collapse of the Soviet bloc and uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to kind of wrap up and fast forward to the end. Uh, I, I could not or did not go back to Iran for 20 years, but in the past 20 years, the revolution is now, it's in 40th year. I did go back and I, I know people in Iran uh, who are, uh, you know, like former leftists, some of them are just good old-fashioned Stalinists who just say, yes, 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 we have to change, and we have changed. Uh, some of them are various kinds of uh, socialists. Some are Marxists, uh, the new generation, who are uh, actually quite sophisticated, many of them. They, many of them have switched to cyber state. They run websites. Oh, it meant, this is where I wanted to go, sorry. Uh, let's see if I can uh, show you some of. Uh, 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 oh, we're not. Okay, well, those those are their their uh, uh, cyberspace activism is one of them is called, for example, critique of political economy. And I know people who are running it. They write, uh, you know, uh, quite sophisticated analysis. Uh, because as Kevin was explaining, Iran is, is not isolated from the rest of the world. It's people who, especially the younger generation, are quite savvy with information technology. And uh, what is kind of the intellectual place of what might be called the left in Iran is the same kind of left you have globally. It's uh, There are people who are, the anarchists also exist, but not, not all that many different kind of socialists, some Marxists. Uh, the activists are usually university students. Uh, the ones, the kind of the uh, hegemonic elite are some kind of academics or established intellectuals who as long as I, they stay on the safe margin of being theoretical, you can have kind of endless debates, you know, Agamben and Ranciere and uh, Carl Schmitt and Hegel and but even Marx, Marx is translated quite legally. You can go purchase as many copies of Das Kapital in Persian translation and read it endlessly. No one bothers you. But if two people get together and organize to you know, have a, uh, any kind of like environmental strike, then that's a problem. Um, so uh, I would say um, the Iranian left is a potentiality that Kevin mentioned this. I think it has uh, it has possibilities. It has uh, what the uh, pro guerrilla factions after the revolution did. They took part in one uh, national parliamentary election and they pulled 10% of the vote. And I would say if there is any kind of opening of the political space, it's possible that the left can do something like that. And uh, with 10% of the vote, you can do a lot. I mean, 10% of the vote in this country, you can change the entire political system. 
if you're Bernie Sanders and you come out of the Democratic Party and do something else. So, uh, so can the Iranian left. They can, they can create, the model is there. The model is uh, People's Democratic Party in, in Turkey. Uh, environmentalist, uh, open to ethnic demands, which is, by the way, one of the fault lines of, uh, uh, this is what uh, my friend uh, uh, Mehrzad talked about. There, there's another fault line in Iran, and that's the question of ethnicities. So, Kurds, Azeris. Uh, so if there is a more or less a coalition type uh, left that addresses these issues, uh, feminism, environmentalism, uh, gender equality, uh, labor, working class, something like the platform of that party in Turkey, um, I think it could be significant. All you need is, is political presence. I mean, the days of storming heaven or the winter palace, uh, that uh, is not necessarily, at least not on the immediate agenda. In that sense, Plakhanov was right. So uh, yeah, with that, I don't want to belabor the point. I'm going to wrap up and we can, we can have a discussion. <laughs> okay.